Hello everyone, in this video we're going to be talking about Amazon S3 Object Lambda. I'm going to describe to you what problem this new feature solves through an example and then walk you through the details of how it works. This is going to be a two-part video series. In this section I'm going to talk to you about the feature and in the second part I'm going to walk you through how to set this feature up through the console in a step-by-step -step manner. So let's jump right into it and talk about Object Lambda through a practical example. So say we have an application that's centered around e-commerce and we're in the business of processing orders. So we have users that are over here that are submitting all their payment information and placing orders to some backend service over here. Let's just call this order service. So they are submitting their orders. These contain things like order totals, the contents of their orders, et cetera, et cetera. And then let's say that at the end of the day, this order service wants to dump all of their data into S3 or they can even do this on the fly. So say our orders data looks a little bit something like this. So we have a list of order entries. We have information like customer ID, first name, last name, email, order type, and order amount. And of course, we have many, many records that all follow a similar format to this data. Now say we have other applications or other clients that exist in our organization that want to access our data. So they want to look at our data through a variety of different lenses. So maybe there's a use case that looks like this. Maybe there's someone that just wants the purchase or refund records for a particular data set. So in this example here, obviously we'd only return the top record if we were just looking for purchases. We can also have another example where maybe the user wants just the orders with a total over $50. This can be something like a fraud detection use case or something along those lines. There can be other cases where maybe we just want the sum of all the purchases for the given day. This can be great for an order dashboard or end of day reporting mechanism that someone could require. And finally, maybe there's another use case where we want to redact personal information, things like first name, last name, and email, but we still want to give out the rest of the data regarding these particular orders. So there's a million different use cases that you can imagine here, but the commonality between all of them is that they all want to access this data, but just put a different spin on how they're viewing that data. So what are the potential options that we can come up with to solve for all these different use cases to give them access to our data, but without being too overly permissive? So what are those options? What do they look like? Well, there's a couple different ones, so let's just run through them. Uh, we can do something like pre-process the data according to the use cases. So in all four of these use cases we just talked about, uh, we can pre-process that data on the order service side, and then maybe put different copies of this data into our S3 bucket, and then give each of our clients the key or the ARN to that particular data set and just ask them to go ahead and look at that data set in order to perform their function. Now I consider this to be a bad option because it introduces a lot of data redundancy. Data redundancy isn't always a bad thing but as you can imagine we can have a potentially infinite number of access use cases and does that mean that we need to create workflows every time a file is put into the S3 bucket that's going to transform it in a very specific way and then store the data according to that format? It's not scalable, it's not a good approach to this, and it just creates duplication across our data sets. Now the second option is also a bad one, and that's client-side processing or filtering. So in this option, we can just give our clients access to this data and allow them to do with what they please. Now this is bad for a whole bunch of reasons. First of all, it's a very big security vulnerability because we do have personal identifying information here, and if you have any sensible company policy, you should be protecting that data at all costs. It's also bad for several technical reasons. So maybe the consumer of this data is something like a mobile application. With mobile applications that access their data through cell phones, there's typically just a limited amount of bandwidth that you can use and a limited amount of computing power that's available to that device. So we don't necessarily want to give our mobile users the ability to download an entire file. And by the way, these files can be particularly large if they're summations of the entire day's orders and then have to do client-side processing and filtering consuming compute capacity on that device, burning battery life, it's just gonna be a bad experience overall. So this option is also not an ideal one. Now the third one, and this is the one that I immediately thought of when I was thinking about this problem, was to create a API endpoint and then back it with a Lambda function. Now in this option, we can just create a bunch of different endpoints and a bunch of different Lambda functions that satisfy all these four use cases and then give our clients the endpoints so that they can call these things programmatically. Now I would consider this a better option but keep in mind that if you're going with this approach, there's different API endpoints you need to manage, there's different Lambda functions you need to manage, you need to worry about things like deployments, 
And then in addition, API Gateway, which is the natural uh, integration with Lambda functions to create REST APIs, does have additional cost associated with it. So you're going to get hit with that. So this is a pretty good option, but not the best one. And this introduces our topic for discussion in this video, which is something else. And that something else is, of course, S3 Object Lambda. Now, S3 Object Lambda gives you the ability to create different views of your data set according to these variety of different use cases. So let's take another look at what this example looks like when we're looking at it through the lens of using Object Lambda. All right, so with Object Lambda, how does this work? So with Object Lambda, there's a couple prerequisite steps, but in the beginning, you start with your S3 bucket that contains your data set, and of course, that orders.json file that we just had in the previous example. Now, a prerequisite step that you need to do is associate your S3 bucket with a supporting access point. Now, I gotta say, I didn't know anything about access points. I didn't even know they existed as part of S3, but they're kind of a useful thing. What access points allow you to do is that they allow you to more easily manage access to your S3 buckets on an application or client specific basis. So what people had to do before access points existed is that they had to have some very complicated S3 access bucket policies that were very large and difficult to manage. So as an alternative, you can create access points that are application or client specific and the permissions that you specify as part of that access point will be applied to that bucket. And then you can just vend out the access point as opposed to vending out the S3 bucket in question. So we need to perform that initial link between our access point and our S3 bucket. Once you're there, you need to create your Lambda function now. Now your Lambda function, in this case, I just called it the just purchases Lambda function, because this one is gonna do that very basic filtering to just return the purchase orders, but you can do anything you wish in this Lambda function. Provided it takes the input and processes everything correctly, you can transform your data in any which way you please. So once you've created your Lambda function, you can proceed to the next step, which is to create a S3 object Lambda access point. Now this access point is effectively just a endpoint that you point your clients to. So instead of using the ARN of the S3 bucket and provide it with a key that you're looking for, they in turn call get object on the Lambda access point. And this is gonna work the exact same way that it would normally work if they were just calling get object on the S3 bucket as per normal. Now from the client perspective at this point, you have a user over here and all they have to do now is call get object on the just purchases variation or the just purchases specific object Lambda access point. Now what will happen is that the access point will in turn invoke your Lambda function and within the arguments that are passed into that Lambda function, it'll give it a pre-signed S3 URL. So that Lambda function can go ahead and hit that access point to download that orders.json file and then do whatever processing it needs to do. In this case, just filter out all the refunds so that we're only left with purchases. Now the cool thing because we're using Lambda functions is that you can also interact with other third-party data sources. So say you had a use case where you wanted to enrich your data, maybe go out and call another service or grab data from another database and add it to your result set before it gets returned back to the user. You can certainly do that and it's very trivial because we're using Lambda functions. So that's the entire end-to-end -end flow. After the Lambda function is done processing, it'll just return that content back to the user and the user will have that different view of their data. Now, if you wanted to have different views of your data, maybe that redacted use case, then the same process applies. So you would create a redacted function, you would code it up so that it strips out all that personally identified information and then repeat the same process here. So you'd create a new S3 object Lambda access point. You could potentially reuse the same access point or create a new one if this is for a different client application, but it's really your decision at that point. So overall, I would say object lambdas are a really neat and convenient way to give users different views on your data. And they also save you both time and cost. Time in the sense that you don't need to set up API gateway endpoints, you don't need to tie them to your lambda functions. And in terms of cost, you don't need to pay for API gateway in this case, using object lambda access points and just normal access points are totally free. All you pay for in this case, if you're using this flow, is the lambda function cost itself and then the get object request that you're doing when you're trying to pull that data out of S3. So I hope this video is useful. I'll put part two on the right when it's available and thanks so much for watching.